several weeks ago I mentioned and we did do some of it studying various churches and a lot of what the Bible teaches and I took a little vacation of that rather than bore everybody to death with every Sunday afternoon for a good while studying different churches but I want to come back to that now and I have selected the Seventh Day Adventist and we want to examine that group in the light of what the Bible teaches. Uh, Brother Buddy mentioned a while ago about our being able and how we ought to compare everything with what the Bible teaches. And I hear that prayed most often around here. And that is what ought to be done with everything. That's what's going on in life. So we'll go with this as we have time this afternoon to do so. And I want to begin by just reading some things, uh, quotes from different things about the Seventh-day Adventist. And I'll tell you where they come from as we get through with the quotes. Seventh-day Adventism originated about 75 years ago in the work of Mr. Miller, who set, the, um, who set the time for the end of the world in 1843 to 44, adding some doctrines to the original faith. Elder James White and wife in 1846 became the leaders of the Seventh-day uh, branch of Adventism. Now, you notice he said 75 years ago. Well, that's a whole lot longer than that since they started, but that came from the book by D.M. Canwright, who himself was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he wrote it uh, regarding Seventh-day Adventism renounced. Uh, this was a kind of copyright of 1961, but it's older than that, and that's from page 25. There is another quote here regarding them, Adventism in general is a Christian faith based upon the conviction that the second advent of Christ is the sole hope of the world. It holds that the world is evil and will be destroyed by divine intervention and that the wicked are to perish in this cataclysm while the righteous are to be saved. After this cataclysm, Jesus Christ will reign in triumph through a thousand year period or millennium of Revelation 21 through 6. He goes on to say the whole Adventist thesis rests heavily upon the prophetic and apocalyptic text of Daniel and Revelation. And then he said it became strongest and most clearly defined in the United States at first under the leadership of William Miller, 1782 to 1849, of Lowhampton, New York, a veteran of the War of 1812 and a man respected as a diligent student even though he did not have college or seminary training. And he ends with, so influential was Miller that for years his followers were known as Millerites. And uh, this has been around for a long time. That comes from Frank S. Mead's Handbook of Denominations in the United States, the 1961 copyright, page 19. Another quote, in the mid-1800s, William Miller founded a small sect that was called Second Adventists. The Seventh-day idea had not originated. Miller manufactured a chart of prophecy. His prophetic chart provided for the return of Jesus to the world in 1844. It was in 1843 that he first set the date, one year hence, 1844. By his chart of prophecy, he claimed to know the time of the second advent of the Lord to the very day of the month of the year, 1844. When 1844 came and Christ did not come, Mr. Miller changed his chart, said he made a mistake, revised his figures, and set it up one year to 1845. But 1845 came and went, and Jesus did not come. And that again is from uh, Brother Foy Wallace's work, uh, God's Prophetic Word. Now, I want to stop here and mention this about Brother Wallace and his work. The Seventh day Adventists made such a show of things back during World War II in the Houston area that the churches came together uh, as a cooperative effort and they had the Houston Music Hall uh, rented, and that seated hundreds and even thousands of people. And it's only been torn down in the last 20 some odd years. And that's where he preached what became the book, God's Prophetic Word. So it was directly aimed at the Seventh-day Adventist. And if you can find that book, uh, first of all, you'll pay quite a bit for it. But if you can find that book, it's an excellent book, as is any of his material. 
and uh, I suggest that uh, you try to look and find some of that, especially that one. I would certainly recommend that all young preachers get all of his material they, they could, especially God's prophetic word, books of the faith, and so on. But I'll read another one. Um, being profoundly convinced that Seventh-day Adventism is a system of error, I feel it my duty to publish what I know of it. I do it in the fear of God, knowing the sorrow it has brought to my heart and to thousands. I must warn others against it. I do not question the honesty of the Adventists, but their sincerity does not sanctify their errors. I've had to speak plainly, but I trust kindly. I've had to treat each subject briefly and leave many untouched, but I've taken up the main pillars of that faith. If these fall, the whole must go down. He goes ahead to say, again, I bear them record that they are a sincere, devoted, self-sacrificing people, thoroughly believing what they profess. And that, again, is from the first book we looked at, uh, Dean Canwright's uh, Seventh-day Adventism. As I say, it's been around a long time, and when he wrote that book, uh, as far as those times are concerned, then he has led many, many people out of Seventh-day Adventism. Now, let me go back to William Miller. Uh, needless to say, we would simply say that Miller is a false prophet. We are warned over and over again, Old New Testaments, about false prophets. Matthew 7, 15 through 16, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. I want to pause here and say I do not know why it is so hard for members of the Lord's church, at least some of them, to not realize that Satan is not going to appear as Satan. He's going to appear as a good guy. But inwardly, he's a ravening wolf. 1,500 years before Christ uttered these words, here is what God said to Israel of old. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. The prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of them. Deuteronomy 18 to 22. Well, that's just a simply a truism that's always going to be around. Till the end of time, we have the infallible standard of God's word. And when studied and rightly divided, we can recognize any error and anybody teaching error that we have the opportunity to examine. Following uh, Miller's second failure, he did what all false teachers do. He ceased his date setting and disappeared into the woodwork. <laughs> Then we come across Ellen G. White. Subsequent to the prophetic failures of Mr. Miller, Ellen G. White came on the scene, and she claimed that she was an inspired prophetess as well. Now, I've never understood why they wanted to put inspired and prophet or prophetess together. If you are a prophet, you're inspired. Uh, if you're inspired, you are a prophet, but nevertheless, that's what she said. This statement, then, is redundant. Uh, all you have to do is look in Acts 2, 17 through 18, in chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, and see what I just said about if you're inspired, you're a prophet, you're a prophet, you're inspired. Such is the basic meaning of prophet in the New Testament. They were teachers. And there was the prophetic office that came through the laying on of the apostles' hand. And every word of the New Testament was written through the prophetic office, whether it was apostles or those that are not apostles but had that office given to them or that gift given to them by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Now, the followers of Ms. White not only believed she was a prophetess, uh, but also that she had a degree and I don't know what all they fully meant by this, but it was a degree of illumination greater than any existing record, which, of course, would make her equal with any apostle ever inspired of the Holy Spirit, and uh, which we read in the New Testament. So Ms. White attempted to justify Miller's prophetical mistakes, because she was a follower of his, by affirming 
that God put, now mark this, that God put a false prophecy in his mouth to teach his followers how to face disappointment. Now, there is no end to what people will say, do, and even believe uh, if they're not honest of heart and desirous of truth above anything else. In her own writings, White affirmed she had a vision and that in that vision she went to heaven and there's where she found that the Sabbath was not nailed to the cross after all. And uh, at the time all this was going on in her life, because of such things as that, unprecedented claims, she earned the title among a lot of folks of Adeled Ellen. And that stuck with her in a lot of things that she did. In fact, it's <laughs> very interesting to read about her life. It'll keep you awake. It won't put you to sleep at night. Now more specifically to the Bible and Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. Now, I mentioned Ian Canwright. He was a member of the Seventh-day Adventist group, and he was a member for some 28 years. Now, he allegedly read the Bible through line for line, word for word, more than 20 times, and in doing so, he read himself out of that era. And uh, subsequent to leaving the Adventist, he was falsely charged and misrepresented by them uh, numerous times. Canwright wrote the book then, as I mentioned earlier, that really broke the back at that time and the spirit of Adventism and caused a great cataclysmic uh, upset among them. And he correctly points out that in doctrine they differ radically from what is called and what they call themselves evangelical churches, which we would simply say the Protestant denominations. Here is what he wrote. They hold to the materiality of all things, believe in the sonship of Christ, believe that they only have a correct understanding of the prophecies to which they give most of their attention, that the end of the world is to occur in this generation, that we are now in the judgment which began in 1844. She's going to keep that going. That the seventh day, Saturday, must be kept that keeping Sunday is the mark of the beast, that all should pay tithes, that Miss White is inspired as were the writers of the Bible, that the Bible must be interpreted to harmonize with her writings, that they are called of God to give the last warning to the world, that the dead are unconscious, that the wicked and the devil will be annihilated, that all churches but their own are Babylon and rejected of God, that everybody but themselves will soon become spiritualists, and when Christ comes, only 144,000 out of all then living on earth will be saved. And I don't know how Jehovah's Witnesses then are going to half all that up because they claim the same thing. Concerning the Sabbath, here's what's said. The one great point in the Sabbath question upon which Seventh-day Adventists stake the most, upon which they insist the strongest, which they repeat the most confidently, is that the Pope of Rome did change the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first. They assert that this is all the authority Sunday keepers have for observing that day. Sunday is the Pope's Sabbath, and Sunday keeping is the mark of the beast, a terrible sin in the sight of God, and cites Revelation 14, 9 through 12. If you see them working, what they normally do to spread their doctrine. And you may have noticed this. They will come in and over a weekend or something like that. They will have special end time lectures. Basically, they get in the book of Revelation and they're trying to show somewhat like Jehovah's, so-called Jehovah's Witnesses do, uh, that all these things in the book of Revelation are now end times are happening and you can see the signs and you can know this, that, and the other. And they try to go back and show all through history how it's all pointing down to this and they're very premillennial and all this. And that's all they do. They will not publish this is brought to you by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You'll not see that. You'll just see all of this in an ad telling about this and come out if you're interested. Well, of course, people as ignorant as they are of the Bible in general then those things appeal to them. It glitters. It's, it's like going down 
uh, into Las Vegas, I suppose, with all the glitter and all, and it gets you in. And that's exactly how they operate. I'm not exaggerating at all. One time they came to Muskogee. They had the Civic Hall up there, and uh, they were coming. They advertised it the same way. I just described. It was in the paper. So I thought, well, if they can go down and use Civic Hall, I can too if we do it at the same time. <laughs> So we ordered a whole host of tracts that were refuting Seventh-day Adventism. And a number of us at church went down there on the appointed day that they would have their get-together, which was on one night. I don't know what it was. And as they came into the building, we sat there and handed them all a tract on Seventh-day Adventism. Well, it has that on there, and they don't know what's going on. So they took it, and they went in. And then uh, we went out and put it on their cars, and the district uh, superintendent, however they, they organized, they're in districts, he came up and he didn't like it at all because we were handed out that track. He wouldn't take one. His wife was right behind him. She said, I will, and she took one, and they went on in. Well, I thought uh, uh, I would go in and see what's going on too. So they had a question-answer session. And I wrote down questions pertinent to what they were dealing with that night, and they recognized it and had already seen me outside. So they got up in there, began to answer their questions, and they warned everybody. But before we start, we want you to know the devil's in the audience. <laughs> I had no problem knowing who they were talking about. <laughs> but anyway, that's what you get at when you deal with them. But we ought to. We ought to do that kind of thing. Uh, as one said, what are you doing down here? We've got this as a civic center, and you're doing this. I said, I'm standing on public property, handing out tracts. You rented public property, and you're using it, and we're not doing a thing in the world that you're not doing. I said, well, how would you like for us to come over to the church building where you are? I said, you want to stand on public sidewalk? We'd be glad to come over there, and we'll take up the study of the Bible right there on the sidewalk in front of the church building. So you're just welcome to come right on over. I think a couple of them came for a visit, but they didn't say anything. Rather than let me pause and say this. We've gotten out of that militancy in the church of facing these people, and we wonder why that we don't have people interested in Bible studies or want to know what's going on. We don't challenge them in anything. We bought into a view that says, well, we'll nice them to death. We'll just nice everybody to death. We'll just take a feather duster, and we'll just go to dusting everything off. And that's been sold in the church for a long, long time. I read an article the other day. I was glad to see in where it appeared talking about uh, the feminizing of the church. How that everybody's got to the point where think if you're if everybody in the church is not showing feminine qualities, you're not Christian. Well, you just look around you. We've got a church full of snowflakes. The Pope of Rome didn't change the Sabbath from the seventh to the first. In 606 A.D., Bonifacio III became the first man to receive the title of Pope, because Roman Catholicism is a developing thing. So it took quite a few years for them to get to that point. But it was in 1870, and you might be surprised it was this late in Roman Catholicism history, that Pope Pius IX put forth the claim that the Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra, which means in the, what they would call the um, seat of St. Peter, speaking officially, that he's infallible. Now, you might knock the know too along that line, incidentally, that uh, they had a number of the uh, priests and bishops and so forth who didn't really agree with that in 1870. Well, that really wasn't long ago when it comes to where they proclaimed the Pope is infallible. But Sabbath was abrogated 500 years before either of these events. When Paul wrote the Corinthian epistle in around 57 AD, he said the ministration of death written and engraven in stone came with glory but that it was passing away, 2 Corinthians 5, or 3 in verse 7. Well, that ministration of death written and engraven on stones was the Decalogue, Ten Commandments. Or it includes the Ten Commandments, and that included the Sabbath. When the apostle wrote his first prison epistle, uh, that would be Ephesians 62, thereabouts A.D., he said Christ abolished in his flesh the enmity, that means hate, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, chapter 215. Well, the law of commandments contained in ordinances certainly included the Ten Commandments, which included the Sabbath. When the second prison epistle, which is the letter to the Colossians, was written in around 62 or roughly that, 64 A.D. maybe, the apostle affirmed Christ, uh, that Christ had uh, 
blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, and then taking it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, chapter 2, verse 14. So the Bible teaches the Sabbath was done away. When? In the first century. Not the seventh. And it was Christ himself who did it. Through his death on the cross, he removed it. It wasn't the Pope of Rome or anybody else. So we're under the authority to Christ. All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. Thus, he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. He's our high priest. And we as priests, making up the temple of God the church, approach the Father through our high priest. The Adventists are guilty of another uh, serious doctrinal infraction. That of trying to set the time when the world would end. Now, I just don't understand that, but a number of these folks have done this kind of thing. <laughs> it was told on Brother Foy Wallace and everybody that traveled any distance to preach meetings rode the train back in the 30s, and he was battling premillennialism all through the 30s. And I think if there's any one man in the Lord's church who defeated it in the church, he did back in those days. And he was going uh, by train to preach somewhere, and this guy came down the aisle declaring that... Uh, the world was coming to an end and declared a certain time it was going to happen when the Lord would return. And uh, Brother Wallace just stood up, took his Bible, threw it down the floor in front of him. He pretended to jump up and down on it. And it shocked the man. And I guess it shocked everybody else too. But he said, what are you doing? That's the Bible. That's the Word of God. He said, well, I just found out that Bible's a liar. It says nobody knows when he's coming back. You just told us he did. Well, sometimes we don't have the boldness enough to strike a point that really gets people's attention but nevertheless well, uh, when you look at this particular matter we see that Matthew 24 36 says but of that day and hour knoweth no man not even the angels of heaven neither the son but the father only while the Lord walked this earth that was what he said now who is going to rise up and say I do I'd be afraid to get up and say I know exactly what he's coming when the Bible makes it clear nobody knows Besides that, if we know the truth and live the truth, what difference does it make whether it comes now, five years from now, or a hundred years from now? What difference does it make? You're faithful to him, then you're acceptable. But then they also uh, are wrong on things pertaining to what death is and um, the act of, uh, or the fact of, what they would like to have is the fact of saying you're unconscious when you die. So they believe when you die that you go completely unconscious. In this, they're joined, as you know, by other people who believe the same thing. Um, death means separation. It's just that simple. It does not mean annihilation. God told the man that he, that is Adam, that you don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that they eat thereof, you shall surely die. Genesis 2.17. But the man, Adam, ate that which was forbidden. Did he not? And yes, he did. He sinned against God. Uh, well, did he die as God said he would when he ate it? Yes, he did. Immediately, spiritually, he was separated from God. Yet he continued to live physically. But he did eventually at 930 years old, Genesis 5 and verse 5, he died. The body apart from the spirit is dead. It's separated. And that's what happened with Adam when he reached 930 years old or in his 930th year. Now, was Adam unconscious from the time he ate the forbidden fruit until he died in 1930? In 930, 930 years old? Remember, he died spiritually immediately when he partook of the fruit. Well, no, he didn't because death does not mean annihilation. Now, if you take the position death always means that you're annihilated, well, you're going to have a lot of problems with, uh, with harmonizing a number of things. Adam became separated from God by the guilt of his own sin. Death is separation. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, and Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. We've noted James 2, 26, the body apart from the spirit is dead. That's as simple a definition as in the whole Bible as to what death is. The body apart from the spirit is dead. The Adventists then incorrectly use certain texts in the book of Ecclesiastes, and they're not the only ones. Uh, witnesses, so-called, will do the same thing, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. 
they will use passages in the book of Ecclesiastes for their so-called proof of their belief about uh, the dead. And here's the prime one they use, and it's simply answered. They'll say, well, chapter 9, verse 5 says, the dead know not anything. So you see, the person dead doesn't know anything. He's unconscious. Well, that's how you pick what part of the verse you want and forget about the other because it's modified in that same verse. The dead know not anything. Now listen, under the sun. Chapter 8, 15 and 9, verses 3 through 9. Where do they know not anything when they die? Back here on earth. When you die on this uh, here and your body separated, it returns to God, it goes to the Hadean world, place of departed spirits. You know what's going on back here on this earth. Now that passage also refutes a lot of other things. You notice here lately, it's been going over some years, people die and they talk about it. Well, your mother's sitting there watching over everything you do, and I know she'd be happy seeing you do this, or your daddy, or your, I'm sure, a dog too, some people, sitting there just so happy as they can be. They don't know what's going on on this earth. You know, I'm glad to be rid of it. If you want to know the truth of it, why in the world be continually burdened with all that's going on on this earth? The Lord frees us from that when we die. And of course, if you're ready to meet your maker, then that's just one of the blessings of being there. Now, if somebody says, well, you may know what's going on on this earth. Yeah, somebody might come later on and tell you what's happening if you're interested. <laughs> I don't want you to be interested in not. Uh, I know of one preacher who years ago, uh, wife had died, and a friend of his wife was in the process of dying. It's a matter of hours before she died. And he said, when you see so-and-so, would you tell her such and such? Well, that may seem blasphemous. I don't know why it would be. After all, look at the conversation between Abraham, the rich man, and so on. So obviously, I guess they could know something from the standpoint of somebody taking them information. But I don't know when I get over there if I'm interested in knowing what's going on back here or not. There will be such a radical change beyond our mind to think of anything. But anyway, the dead know not anything. Where? Under the sun. So when we die, we don't know what's going on here anymore. Then uh, they mention the annihilation of the wicked. Uh, that is really insufficient punishment in view of the fact that they live and die in rebellion toward God. The complete destruction of the wicked would not require, listen, unquenchable fire. What is unquenchable fire? It's fire that won't go out. You know, you remember Smokey the Bear when it had so much in it. Advertisements over when you got a campfire out, fire out in the woods and you leave it, you're supposed to have it good and out or however they said it. You quenched it. You put it out. No fire at all anywhere around. Well, I read in Mark 9, 43 through 48, that the fires of torment are unquenchable. Now, if they're going to burn somebody up and that's the end of it, they are annihilated, they go out of existence, why do they have to keep burning? Unless, I guess, maybe keep being fed by people to keep the fires going. I don't know. But it's unquenchable means incapable of being put out. And why have a fire that could be extinguished even though its purpose has been served? And after all, at the end of time, and everybody that's lost, and there's nobody else to be lost, and they've suffered the unquenchable fire. Why do they have to, why does it have to keep burning? I really don't understand that. Materialists try to use Jesus as a witness for their cause because he said, And be not afraid of them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Matthew 10, 28. They look at the word destroy, and in their minds it means he's gone out of existence. He's annihilated. Well, here's where we need to study the Bible better. The idea is not extinction, but it's ruin. It's loss. It's not of being, but of well-being. Listen, you realize that the people, when hell comes about, at the end of the world, and after the judgment, and people are consigned to hell, they exist forever. Well, the people in heaven exist forever. What's the difference? They both exist forever. It's the quality of life that makes life eternal, and it's called life. 
And that's the point that needs to be understood. Paul the Apostle told the Thessalonian Christians that the Lord's vengeance in flaming fire in the form of everlasting destruction will be taken on the ones not knowing God and the ones that did not obey the gospel of Christ, as we quoted this morning in the lesson, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, and 9. He also told the Roman brethren that tribulation and anguish would be upon every soul of him that doeth evil, chapter 2 and verse 9. And Christ himself said, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living, Matthew twenty-two thirty-two. 32. Well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob physically have been dead for hundreds and hundreds of years. So how can he say in Jesus' day that he's the God of the living? It's because their bodies were dead and had returned to dust, but their spirits continued to live. That which made them what they were and are to this very day, if you please, and will be forever still existed, and God was the God of of the living and not of the dead. They were not annihilated. They didn't go out of existence. And that's an important point to keep in mind. Well, one more thing, and then the lesson will be yours. The Adventists also practice tithing. And uh, that's another doctrine that's not obligatory on New Testament Christians. It's not authorized by the New Testament. It's been erroneously supposed that Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 obligates Christians to tithe. And I hear people who are ignorant of speaking as the oracles of God sometimes talk about the free will contribution that Christians make as being our tithe. Well, you're just simply not speaking as oracles of God and you don't understand what's been taught by the Bible. The righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees is not a righteousness of degree, but it's a righteousness of kind. So there's no comfort in this passage for those who believe in tithing because remember the Lord said your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Well, it's in kind that our righteousness exceeds. The tithe, which is literally a tenth, was bound on the Jews of the Old Testament, not on Christians of the New Testament, and we're not under the Old Testament anymore as authority for us and our approach to God and service to God. The tithe, really, if you look at it, the tithe under the law for the Jews were more like some sort of income tax than anything else. The people didn't have any say in it. They had to give a tenth. Now, if you look at all of the giving that was done under the law, authorized by the law, free will offerings and all, if a Jew really took advantage of all that was there, he'd give up to a third of what he had. But the tenth had to be. He had no question. It wasn't any free will offering. You give a tenth. And God simply claimed one tenth right off the top. That's what it amounts to. Today the Lord has authorized us to give as we've been prospered. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. To give as we plan. 2 Corinthians 8, 10 through 11. As we purpose in our heart, which involves planning. Chapter 9, verse 7. And to be cheerful about our giving, 9-7. Christianity is giving. Our very bodies, Romans 12, 1 and 2, are living sacrifices. You offer the dead sacrifices authorized by the law. But our very bodies being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, we have shackled ourselves to Christ as living slaves because He's the way, the truth, and the life. We can't get to heaven except through Him and His gospel. Therefore, tithing is not a gospel doctrine. It's an Old Testament legislation that's been abrogated, which means set aside and has been laid, nailed to the cross. So it should be understood from the first to the last when we compare the teachings of men, and this is true in every case, in the teaching of the Bible, that we are not putting the Bible on trial, not at all. We're not attempting to harmonize the Bible with human doctrines. What we are doing is taking the Bible, God's infallible word, his final revelation to man, 
complete in all respects for what God gave it, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That's why it's called the perfect law of liberty, James 1, verse 25. And we're reconciling what men believe with what the Bible teaches. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. That's our duty. That's part of being faithful. Even as we worship according to first day of the week, worship of the church and assembly and all five acts of worship, which we learn from the study of the scriptures, then part of our service, faithful service, is to determine from the Bible just what God binds on us and what is not. And to examine anything anybody would bring along and say, now this is from God, and determine whether it is or it's not. I remember one time that was said of an old farmer over in Tennessee that somebody came in and saw there was no mechanical instruments of music anywhere around, and he heard the church sing. And so he came up and said to the old farmer, says, why don't you all have an organ or a piano here? And the old man said, we ain't got no Bible for it. And that's as good an answer as you can give since we're to do all things by the authority of Christ, Colossians 3.17. If you ain't got no Bible for it, you better leave it alone. Now, if you're not a Christian, now's the time to come one because the only time you're guaranteed is right now to believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. The Lord will add you to His church. You read about it in your own Bible. The only place you can find the true description of the church the true primary source is the bible and the new testament in particular and you can read about it right there as a child of god are you faithful do you have bible for all you believe if you've transgressed in some way the rule for the second law of pardon is repent confess sins having repented of them if you're subject to the lord's invitation we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing